Did you say numerical fluid? What I, I forgot. Whatever the time. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain. I'll explain. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for inviting me here. Um, I'm Darren Crowdy from Imperial College, so just so you know, I'll be here uh, for three months over the course of the next 12 months. So um, in one month periods. So I'll be here for a month and then again two months next year. Um, and uh, I'm here to do a, to a few things, give a few lectures this week and next week, um, and also, of course, I'm here to interact with people. So uh, please feel free to drop me an email if, uh, if you'd like to talk to me. I'd like to learn what people here are doing. And uh, I've chosen these lectures to give you an idea of what I'm doing right now in my research. So uh, I, can't, I haven't got a poster here, but I can't remember what I called it. Uh, but it's got MOFs, uh, microfluidics, and microorganisms in the title. Um, and those are all application areas that I'm working in in research at the moment, uh, different projects. Uh, MOFs stands for microstructured optical fibers. I'll tell you about. Uh, microorganisms, um, which you think of as uh, bacteria, or low Reynolds number swimmers of various general kinds, or even colloidal particles, or particles in suspensions. And what was the other one? Oh, microfluidics, uh, which is uh, a very hot topic these days in the study of uh, super hydrophobic surfaces. And um, just to give you an idea, so uh, the last few months I've had a visitor from uh, a mechanical engineer from Tufts University visiting me at Imperial. Uh, he and I have been talking about problems to do with direct liquid cooling of microchips. So one of the things that's uh, limiting capacity on miniaturization these days is the fact that chips are producing too much heat. And one of the ways that uh, it was an old method used 20, 30 years ago, and it's resurfaced, it's called direct liquid cooling. You're literally using water and uh, other, other liquids to try to cool the chips more quickly than air does. So this is a hot topic of research at the moment. Um, and uh, what these lectures are uh, planning to do is to show you how to, s to study low Reynolds number hydrodynamics. In other words, the motion of very slow viscous fluids with complex analysis, which isn't something that most people who study low Reynolds number hydrodynamics do, does. They don't do it. So this is a rather interesting course because uh, there's lots of potential if you're a graduate student for uh, solving problems that people can't solve using other methods um, and also just uh, finding interesting problems uh, to solve that haven't been solved because of all of these new technologies. Uh, just so I get an idea, does everybody know what I mean by a Reynolds number? Let me just write down the equations we're going to be solving. I'll give you a flavor of um, the, the PDEs we're going to be solving. So these are Stokes equations. And here they are. And I'm going to put little twiddles on the uh, on the gradient operators here, because uh, what I mean by that is a, a, a three-dimensional gradient. Okay. And uh, what we're trying to find here is uh, a three-dimensional velocity field, UVW, and a pressure field, P, which is a scalar. So you can see, first of all, that these are the Stokes equations. By the way, the zero here appears because I've set the Reynolds, num the Reynolds number in the Navier-Stokes equations to zero. Okay. So people call this the Stokes equations. Uh, some people call them the creeping flow equations because basically, by the way, the Reynolds number is basically a velocity scale times a length scale divided by viscosity. 
so these equations generally hold if you've got uh, uh, things moving at small speeds on small scales in very viscous fluid. Now the first thing to notice about these is that they're linear, which is very helpful. Um, and this, by the way, is just a statement of the fact that we're going to consider incompressible fluids. Now, I only have 12 lectures, so uh, I'm not going to derive those at all. I'm simply going to present those as the ones that uh, we're going to try to solve in this lecture course. So if you haven't seen those before, um, uh, I can uh, discuss with you personally wh where they come from if you're interested. Uh, but in order that I achieve something in 12 lectures, I'm going to take these as the equations we're solving. Okay? Now, they're three-dimensional equations. Um, and uh, here's a second question for you, by the way. Has everybody taken a basic course in complex variable methods, complex analysis? Yeah? Just nods. <laughs> okay, good. So I, I'm going to start fairly basically, but there will be a few things I have to uh, ask you to believe if you haven't seen it before, but uh, you say you have. But it won't be anything uh, too advanced. Okay, let me, let me just give you an idea in the, in the context of, uh, I'm going to show you some slides later, because by the way, this is the first time I've ever lectured for three hours. <laughs> I've done two before, but uh, never three. So I'll see if I last. Uh, break. <laughs> okay. I think what I'm going to do is I'll go for 50 minutes, then we'll have a 10 minute break, and then another 50 minutes. Um, and by lecture three, I may well just show you some slides. <laughs> I'll be tired. Um, let me just give you an idea of how useful superhydrophobic surfaces are. This is just one of the applications I, I hope to talk about later, probably next week. Uh, so let's suppose, uh, let's suppose we've got some surface. Okay. Okay, and maybe, and this is what people do. This is you know, a two-dimensional surface, and what people do is they perhaps etch grooves, grooves or microchannels. These are, think of this as a microchannel, and the bottom of the microchannel has these grooves in it. Okay, so these are grooves or uh, trenches. Uh, lots of different names for these things. Basically, people etch uh, some grooves into these uh, surfaces. Let's uh, give ourselves a coordinate system. Let's call this x, y, and uh, coming out of the board. In other words, the, the, uh, the grooves are in a z twiddle direction. I'm going to put z twiddle. You'll see why later. Okay. So, in Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z tilde, twiddle. Stokes equations are so in these coordinates, Stokes equations as follows. Uh, we'll just write them out in the coordinate wise. Give you the first component there. The y component will be this. And then the z tilde component. Okay, and then of course the, the last equation is the divergence free condition. Okay, I've just written those equations out uh, in a Cartesian coordinate system. So, I told you the equations are linear. So we can think of separating the a flow over that surface in two different directions. And this is what people do. So let's, uh, let's consider case one. People call this transverse flow. So in the literature, you see this word a lot. Transverse flow, this is when you uh, suppose that uh, 
w is zero, and this is the right order, and that u is just a function of x and y, and so is v. So uh, one thing you can have in, in, your, in your head here, perhaps, is a, uh, maybe a shear flow basically going across or transverse to the grooves. Remember, the grooves are aligned with this direction. Okay, they're parallel to this uh, Z tilde direction. So I've got flow across them or transverse to the grooves. Okay, so there's just flow in the XY plane. Then uh, we, get a re uh, we get a simplification here, of course. Uh, what does this one tell us? Well, W is zero which tells us that dp by dz tilde is zero, okay? So w is equal to zero, let's, not, let's label these. Uh, so three, and w is equal to zero implies that p is just a function of x and y. Okay? Because this is zero, so dp by dz tilde is zero. It doesn't depend upon z tilde. And then one and two imply that uh, oh, I'm just going to write like this. And then of course we have u by the x plus v by the y is zero. So this is the Or implies this one. By the way, gr gradient now is a two-dimensional Laplacian operator, gradient operator. So there's no tilde. Okay? So in the case when things are just coming transverse over here and uh, things aren't moving in this direction, they're just moving uh, across, then uh, these are the equations you get. You get this 2D uh, version of the Stokes equations with this. What are you tempted to do when you have an incompressible two-dimensional flow? Well, I don't know about you, but I can't resist introducing a stream function to describe the flow. So 2D incompressible flow this means that there exists a psi, a stream function we call it, such that u is uh, the y derivative of this thing, and v is minus the uh, x derivative, and then you can see that if I uh, substitute these into this left-hand side, it's automatically satisfied. Okay? This is a standard thing to do in fluid mechanics when you have an incompressible flow with a symmetry. In this case, the symmetry is the independence of the z-tilde uh, coordinate. Okay. Let's just uh, consider the vorticity. Which is defined to be the curl of the velocity field. Then of course, because the, uh, under our assumptions, this transverse flow, the velocity field has a zero here, the curl of this is gonna be purely in the z-tilde direction. So here it's going to be zero, zero, v by dx minus v by dy. Okay? And in fact, uh, I've underlined that omega, but I'm going to call this scalar omega. Okay, so it's just the uh, vorticity to strength in the z tilde direction. 
And of course, note the following, that if omega is this by definition, then I can substitute uh, for the string function now to find out how the vorticity is associated with the string function. And you can see that what I get here, there's a minus sign there, <coughs> there's another x derivative, so I get minus d squared psi by the x squared, minus, there's another minus sign there, and plus there, so I get minus d squared psi by the y squared, which is minus this Laplacian with no hat because it's two dimensional. Okay, so the vorticity coming into the z tilde direction is del squared uh, psi, where psi is our two dimensional screen function. Am I going about the right speed? By the way, I'm just giving you background here, but we, we, this is all very useful. That's just a kinematic relation between the vorticity and the string function. But suppose I go back to my original Stokes equations and take the curl of them. What's the curl of grad P? Zero. Curl grad is zero. And what's the curl of this one? Well, it's del squared curl u, which is del squared omega is zero. So I've got the curl of the Stokes equations implies zero is, okay, this is just del squared omega with an underscore. That. So look, this is, the, this is what the dynamics of the Stokes equations is telling me. And this is a kinematic relation between the vorticity and the string function. So if I now combine this with that, I've got the zero. Is, so let's combine these two. We've got del squared of del squared psi is equal to zero. And we can write this as del four psi. And this, of course, is what people call the biharmonic equation. Biharmonic because there's two of these things, two, two uh, the classian operators. So where does complex analysis come in? I haven't done any complex analysis yet. I've just looked at the Stokes equations and the whole point of this is to argue why we're dealing with complex analysis. Can anybody tell me why? I've just shown you that for transverse flow, for across these ridges or grooves, we need to solve this with some boundary conditions on the, on the surface and into infinity. But the reason uh, that complex analysis comes in is the following remarkable fact. There is a general solution to this equation that you can write down. And here it is. I'll just call it psi. That's where the complex analysis comes in because I can write the general solution for my psi, which is the only thing I need to, to find in terms of two functions that we're going to call analytic functions. Uh, they're analytic functions in the fluid, f and g. I'm going to tell you in a bit what I mean by an analytic function.
By the way, uh, I tend to call f and g complex potentials. Um, if you're a solid uh, mechanics person and you study elasticity, you often see this uh, certainly more frequently than people who study Stokes flows. And there, f and g are called the Gorsa functions. I don't know if you've heard of this. So f and g uh, are sometimes called Gorsa functions. That's just a historical thing. I just call them complex potentials. G O U R S A Gorsa. Let's look at the second case. Longitudinal flow. We call this longitudinal flow because uh, now what I'm going to do is instead of having a transverse flow across the ridges with no flow in and out of the board, I'm not going to have any cross flow. So I'm going to suppose u and v is 0. And I'm just going to have flow in and out of the board. In other words, along the grooves, along the trenches. So uh, but v, w is not equal to 0. And in fact, w is, we're going to suppose it's just a function of x and y. So this is longitudinal flow, because you can imagine flow going along the grooves now. So what do the Stokes equations tell us then? If u and v are assumed to be 0, what does that tell What does 1 and 2 tell us? One and two tell us that dp by dx is zero and dp by dy is zero, which means that the pressure field can only depend upon the z tilde coordinate. So let's call it capital P. It just depends upon one axial coordinate. So that's one and two done. <coughs> it only leaves us with three. Then 3 implies, oh, by the way, in order to write this down, of course, I've used, I've used 4. Uh, and then this one implies, number 3, the final one implies that del squared w is, well, remember, p now is only a function of z tilde, and here it is, so it's p prime z tilde. What do mathematicians call this type of equation? We've got Laplace's equation, but it's got a forcing on the other side. Notice, by the way, the structure of this. This is the two-dimensional Laplacian operator in x and y. But on the right-hand side, I don't have x and y. I just have z tilde. <coughs> so as far as this operator is concerned, this is a constant. So you can see that this is an example of a Poisson equation. Forced, forced the Laplacian. And again, the reason I'm showing you this is because you can write down the general solution. Well, here it is. I'll, I'll, I'll derive all this for you uh, later in the course. There's a mysterious four coming in here, but you'll see why later. Oh, I forgot to tell you earlier, by the way. I forgot to tell you what z is. Over here, even. This is not, remember, that's why I put z tilde, because z tilde is the coordinate coming out of the board here. Uh, z is x plus i, y. i is the square root of minus 1.
Okay, what I'm claiming is that the generals, if you give me a P, some pressure, axial pressure distribution, then the general solution, if this is known, is given by this, where H, of course, is not yet known. This is the general solution. So my point in showing you this is that if you're solving three-dimensional Stokes flows, three-dimensional Stokes flows, you can essentially find, because they're linear, you can essentially find the solutions in terms of three analytic functions, complex potential, F, G, and H. Any questions? This one. Yes, that's what I just did here. Sorry, I should have done it here. Yes, sorry, I should have done this here because my whole point is that um, the, the reason I put tilde over here in the first place is because I knew I was going to use z as x plus i y. That's why I didn't put tilde. I could have put tilde over everything. But I wanted to distinguish this axial coordinate from the uh, complex coordinate in the xy plane. Notational reason. Okay. Yep. Um, in the, uh, the other last question, uh, in the imaginary part, yep. uh, which, uh, there is an H function, uh, but uh, this system, uh, this system has some symmet uh, symmetry uh, rotating around the some rotating to the Z tilde axis. So uh, I I think H has some restriction about it. Yes, yes. You'll see. Okay, you'll you you will see this coming up. Remember, we still got we still got the three we still got the Z tilde coming in here. Okay. What? So so really, you should think of this in in each in each Z tilde position. You can write uh, the form of this. So so perhaps perhaps what we should really do here to make to make it even more complicated is put maybe semicolon z tilde there. Thank you for asking these questions. Uh, you see, what I'm trying to say is in, at each z station, I can think of an x, y plane in which the general solution can be written down like this. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, I think h has some symmetry of the rot rotating around the z tilde. So, uh, H, H depends on not only Z, not not on Z, but uh, the absolute value of Z. Uh, we'll we'll see, we'll we'll see how H comes out. We'll solve some we'll solve some of these. We'll come back to your point. Okay. I won't go into it now. Uh, uh, by next week it won't be this week. I don't think we've got too much to do. But I'll I'll, I'll find some H's for you. By the way. In most microfluidics applications in, in these superhydrophobic surfaces, P is usually constant or linear. Because what does uh, P being a linear function of Z tilde correspond to? It corresponds to a constant pressure gradient. So often people are driving flows through these microchips using constant pressure gradients. Okay? Um, often, by the way, uh, in other applications, you have to find P as part of the solution. Okay, in fact, if you f find how it evolves axially uh, down, the, down the chip according to the boundary conditions at the end point. We see all of this in action. I'm just trying to give you a flavor of uh, how analytic functions arise. Okay? So you get two coming in from transverse flows across the grooves, and you get another one coming in from longitudinal flows. I erase. Okay, that was to just, um, the, uh, the other reason I like this is because a lot of people think that, um, a lot of people think that sto complex analysis means you can only solve two dimensional problems. And it's not true. Okay, and what's more interesting is in the MOF application, the optical fiber application, 
we're using uh, what you see optical fibers tend to be long and slender and but they change shape as you go down you see and so what happening happens is there's an interesting uh, coupling of a cross plane problem with a transverse flow problem in other words the transverse problem couples with the longitudinal problem in very interesting ways but it allows you to basically use complex analysis to solve these 3d problems Okay, I have actually, uh, I'll let you have them. Uh, I, I gave a, I was invited to give a course, just six lectures uh, in Italy in uh, May on the use of complex analysis in uh, studying low Reynolds number swimming. And I prepared some notes for that, which I'll let you all have uh, because it, it presents all the background material uh, in the context of that particular application. Okay. Ultimately, complex variables is just a convenient change of variables. That's all it is. When I say convenient, it's a change of variables that has all kinds of mathematical bonuses. <coughs> so it's not just any old change of variables, but ultimately, it's just a change of variables. So in other words, if I'm solving some problem involving an a, a R2, an XY plane, then change of variables, uh, let's let Z be X plus IY. And look, look at this. I'm going to define Z bar to be this very curious object, which is X minus IY. where i is the square root of minus 1. You've all seen this before. Okay. This is a change of variables. So suppose I change to r theta coordinates, which is polar coordinates. What, what would you do? Uh, what you do is you take some uh, function. So let's let b be some function. function of x and y, any old function, and uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us the following, doesn't it? Tells us that a little differential, a little change in phi, or phi, whatever you want to call it, is actually the leading order of this. We've all seen these partial derivatives before. And remember that whenever you see a partial, if you've chosen x, y as your coordinates, then d phi by dx implicitly means that you're keeping the other one constant when you take that derivative, and vice versa here. So, what is this? Question for you. Just asking very natural questions. If I change from x, y to r theta, you ask yourself, well, what's d uh, phi by d r at constant theta? So I'm asking instead, I'm not using r theta, I'm using z, z bar. So in other words, I'm asking what's d phi by d z at constant z bar? Well, we know how to work it out. We use this. So let's, you can think of this, by the way, uh, of course, uh, just be careful about all this, but uh, basically I want to divide this equation by dz. 
keeping that bar fixed. So <clears throat> you can see what it is. D5 by dx is just D5 by dx. But then the dx gets divided by dz at big z bar. And then this is just defined by dy, dy by dz. Big z bar. By the way, I'll come back to this. Whenever you do a change of variables, I've told you here what z and z bar are in terms of x and y, but you should always ask what the inverse transformation is. So what's x? I want to know what x is in terms of z, z and z bar. Well, easiest thing to do is add and divide by 2. So this is z plus z bar over 2. And then I subtract. And then I get that minus that, which is 2i y. And this is z minus z bar. These cancel. So y is z minus z bar over 2i. Right? So this is my uh, forward change of variables. This is my backward change of variables. These are going to be very helpful now, because I need to work out this thing. What's these x by dz at big z bar? Oh, I, I saw somebody mouth it in the audience. Feel free to speak up. So this is a half, and then what's dz, y by dz at big z bar? One over two i, look, okay? So, uh, So, this is a very valuable formula that we're going to use a lot. Please don't forget that formula. <coughs> In other words, when you're taking z derivatives, keeping z bar fixed, no, oh, by the way, remember, look what I've got a minus i there. Don't forget what I've used here is the fact that 1 over i is minus i. Because i squared is minus 1. Okay? And there's a, there's, a, there's a 2 here, a half. Don't forget that. It's very important. That's actually the reason why a 4 crept in earlier on. But there's these, these little uh, troublesome 2s that crop in. Similarly, exactly similarly, uh, What's the other, what's this one? D by dz bar keeping z fixed. Just go through the same procedure. The only thing that changes is that, th is that this sign becomes a plus. By the way, I use these all the time, and here's how I remember them. But there's always the two. You must remember the half. But z is x plus i y. But it's always but that one's the minus sign. Okay, that's how I remember it. It's always the opposite to what you'd expect. So if you're taking d by dz, which is x plus i y, you get the minus sign there. Don't forget the two. And here's the z bar, which is the minus sign. You get the plus sign. So it's the opposite to what you expect. Okay. Everybody said they've seen some complex analysis before, and I've already mentioned the word analytic function. How would you define an analytic, what is an analytic function? Or function analytic, you have to, strictly speaking, of course, this is all very informal. Uh, you have to define an open set, uh, you have to define an analytic function set and all that stuff. I'm assuming that's all in the background. Roughly, what, what do we mean by an analytic function? Let's see if you can give me the simplest uh, definition.
Well, let me give you my favorite definition. Uh, hands up, who's heard of the Cauchy-Riemann equations? Cauchy-Riemann equations is normally people think of Cauchy-Riemann equations when they think of analytic functions. Um, some people think of orthogonal grids when they think of analytic functions. Lots of different things. Here's how I define an analytic function. Let's let capital Phi be some function, regular function, there's no singular of, of, of Z and Z bar. I'm going to say that phi is actually an analytic function if and only if, look, this is it. I'm, I don't want it, all right, let me ask you something. I don't want it to depend on z bar. At the moment, phi is any old function of z and z bar. What I'm going to define is a special subclass of such functions that do not depend upon z bar and only depend upon z. What's a mathematical way of saying that that's concise? You want a function to not depend on z bar. Well, what about this? I do not want it to change when I change z bar. How can it if it doesn't depend on z bar? Okay, so that's how I like to think of analytic functions. You just take the general class of functions, but then you don't, you think of the special class that don't depend on z bar. That's it. That's an analytic function. Let's suppose uh, that uh, this capital phi is the real part phi, little phi, and then it has imaginary part psi. Let's just rewrite this. Let's call this star star. Well, remember, it's just d by dz bar of phi is just, look, it's that. It's, it's the bottom one. That's just phi. And what I'm going to do, look, is I'm going to expand it out because this is complex operator, this is a complex thing. Let me just uh, tidy it up a bit. I'll take, I'll keep the half outside. Look what I get. I get the phi by the x. That's real. Phi and the little phi and little psi are real. That one's gonna be imaginary. This cross is gonna be imaginary. This one is gonna give me another real one. So I'm gonna get the phi by the x from the first term and these, these two give me minus the psi by the y. That's the real part. Let me correct the, <coughs> correct the imaginary part. And the whole point is, star star says this is zero. That's just saying it doesn't depend on z bar. So I've got a complex equation here. Real part plus imaginary part is equal to zero. Complex equation implies two real equations. You will create a real imaginary part. So the real part <coughs> measuring part in other words my statement here is equivalent to my statement this other statement here and what are these 
if you've seen these before, which you, I think you probably have, these are known as the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Cauchy-Riemann equations are famous equations that relate the real differential equations that relate the real and imaginary parts of an um, analytic function. That's one thing you can say. But another definition of analytic function is simply any old function that doesn't depend on Lebron. Okay, I'll, I'm going to take a break in two minutes. We'll do some some tea. Uh, but let's make a note. Suppose uh, del squared, del squared, uh, some other thing. Um, well, let, let me let me just call it by. It's, it's not miss what I was talking about then. It's just Laplace's equation. In some, in some open set or in some domain that you give me, whatever. Uh, another way of saying it is people, people like to use the word harmonic. It's a harmonic function. Two-dimensional, of course. So the Laplacian operator, of course, is this. Now, whenever I see this, there's only one thing that uh, I think of doing. This is a, this is a second order differential operator. I'm just dying to, comp to, to uh, what's this called? Difference of two squares. Because look, plus is of course minus minus. Just a difference of two squares. So another, I'm going to factorize the operator. So it's, I'm going to write it like this, everybody. Square root of that square root of that operator. In other words, the operator which, when composed with itself, gives this operator is this one. And then the operator which composed with itself uh, is this uh, gives that is this one. And then because of that, I get a minus b a plus b. This, this is just factorizing the operator. <sighs> well, what do we notice? What's this? I've erased it now. Remember, look, it's got the minus i, so which one's that? Yes, it's d2. Two. two times it. Remember, those blasting two. It's two times d by dz. And this one's two d by dz bar. So this is four d uh, by dz bar d by dz of phi. Now, I just love this because, by the way, in PDE theory, this is called, this operation I just did is called moving to characteristic coordinates. Don't know anything about PDE theory. And Z and Z bar are the characteristic coordinates. But look, I can integrate this, can't I? Uh, by the way, what do we immediately know about d phi by dz? Divide by dz is an analytic function. That's what he says. 
Find my definition of an analytic function. It's something whose z bar derivative is zero. So we will immediately know that the v by dz is, let me call it a little p prime. This is some analytic function. At the moment, it's arbitrary. Any old function would do. I put p prime for, for simplicity. It's arbitrary, so why not call it p prime? It's the derivative of some other analytic function, p. I can do that. And then, uh, what do you want to do here? The v by dz is the derivative of p with respect to z. I'm just going to integrate it again. So, integrate now with respect to z. Where q is an arbitrary function of z bar only. By the way, uh, q is a function that's just a function of z bar. So in other words, dq by dz would be zero. Does anybody know what we call functions which are just a function of z bar? You don't hear this term so often, except with uh, you know, potential theorists and things like that. Anybody guess? If functions are just functions of z, we call them analytic. If functions are just functions of z bar, guess what we call them? By the way, some people say holomorphic instead of analytic. What do we call functions of just z and z, just z bar? Anti-analytic or anti-holomorphic. That's all we mean by so in other words, a harmonic function is, a fun is an addition of an analytic and an anti-analytic function. Okay, we'll stop for a break, 10 minute break now, but um, I just have one final thing to check. I'm a little bit worried about my uh, result there. Why? <coughs> P and Q at the moment are completely arbitrary apparently, but implicitly when I started, I was, I was, I didn't tell you this, but let's, let's say this is true. I wanted P to be real. Why should I be a bit worried at this point then? If I want Phi to be real. She's shaking her head, because look, if P and Q are arbitrary, let's pick P Z to be Z and Q Z bar to be cos z bar. Perfectly good analytic anti-analytic function. Uh, phi is then z plus cos z bar. Is that real? For all z? No. It is when z is real, but it's not real everywhere. So that I, there's actually a constraint I still need to impose between p and q if I want phi to be real. By the way, there's a whole class of mathematics called harmonic analysis. And that's where you don't assume that phi is real. And these are just called harmonic functions. The people studied in this. We want to look at uh, real harmonic functions. And then there's a relationship between P and Q. I'll talk about that in 10 minutes. And maybe somebody can tell me what we need to do. OK, thanks for listening. I'll see you in 10 minutes. Q if I want phi to be real for all z and z bar. Well, look, how about this? If you're real, 
valued, we must pick. There's, no, there's, no, uh, there's nothing else to do. If P is arbitrary, then we must pick Q of Z bar to be equal to uh, P bar of Z bar, where we define P bar of Z. This is a definition of what I mean by the function P bar. Now everybody pay attention because uh, it's very rare that you see what I've written down in textbooks, even very good textbooks on complex analysis. So there's a function P of Z, which is an analytic function in this problem. And I've picked Q of Z bar to be what a, a, a new function, which I call P bar. That's the name of this new function. Here's how I define the new function. It's also an analytic function. And what you do is if you give me a point Z, I take its conjugate. And then I put it through the function p that you've already given me. <coughs> and then I take the conjugate of the whole thing. Those three operations are all well defined if you give me a p. Does everybody understand? It's, it's incredible that this isn't emphasized more in textbooks. Because let me say that again. If you give me a point z, I can conjugate it to produce z bar. I can then put it through p. And then I conjugate the answer. Okay. That's an analytic function of z. And I'm going to call it p, p bar. So look, what's, what's q of z bar? I'm saying it's this. So hence, i is p of z plus What's, you see, Q of Z bar is what I need, and it's P bar of Z bar. So which means I put Z bar everywhere I see Z here. So P bar of Z bar is the bar of Z bar, which is Z, all conjugate, put through P and then all conjugated. So it's the conjugate of P of Z. And I know as well as anybody else in this room that if you give me some complex number and add its conjugate, it's always real. That's basically two times the real part of P. So it's always real. Okay? So in other words, if I want phi to be real, it's, it's arbitrary up to some analytic function P, but that's it. There's not P and Q. Does anybody know the name of these new functions? Look, it's remarkable. You, know, you really don't see this emphasized in textbooks. Certainly not the ones I've seen. If I get, let's do a, let's do a, a, a test. Uh, this is a little example. P of Z is that function, okay? Where I, I define the exponential in the usual power series. That's what I mean by the exponential function. What's P bar of Z? It's also an analytic function, but what is it? Let's go through it. And there it is. So what's so let's go through it step by step. P of z bar, is that right, is e to the i z bar. Now I take the conjugate of the whole thing. e to the minus i z. 
So that's P bar Z. Is P bar the same as P? No. One's e to the plus i z. It's Schwartz conjugate function. That's what they're called. Anybody heard that phrase? The Schwartz conjugate of an analytic function. That's what I've just. That's what the bar functions are. That's what I mean by this. So in other words, this is the. This is defined as the. Just for your general information. Definition, if you like. Okay. Let's do another one. Uh, example two. I pick some rational function. So the question is, what's P bar of Z? Con Schwartz conjugate of that function. Well, let's go through it again. Uh, P of Z bar is one plus I Z bar over i plus z bar squared. So p of bar of z is the conjugate of this whole thing, which is one minus i z, so I'm conjugating everything, again, this is a completely different function. <coughs> By the way, uh, we're going to see these short conjugates time and time again, which again amazes me why people don't know. By the way, remember, when you do calculus, basic course in complex analysis, you, basic calculus is the definition of e to the z is by this convergent power series. Of course, you have to prove it converges. Right? How do we define sine of z? Complex function, so z is a complex variable. Well, one definition is again through power series. Z minus z cubed over three factorial plus z to the, etc. But there's another definition. Actually, let's do cos instead. Doesn't matter, sine cos, whatever. It's actually the exponential function plus its Schwartz conjugate divided by two. So it appears the Schwartz conjugate is such a basic object, it appears in our very definition of sine and cosine. And yet we don't really pay attention to them. If you give me an analytic function, there's a Schwartz conjugate function. The reason I'm making a big deal about this is because uh, we're gonna see lots of them in, in these lectures. I needed it here, by the way. I had to choose Q to be the Schwartz conjugate to make sure that things are. So you see, now you know, let me put it this way. Now you know what they are, if you didn't before. You're going to see them all over the place. Just uh, give some not some uh, notation here. We're going to use the arrow notation. To denote a uh, transferring. <coughs> um, to denote, um, let's say this, the complex form of 
strange to complex form. Let me give you an example. So if, e.g., if A is a two-dimensional vector with components, real components AX, AY, they're just real, real numbers, components in R2, we say A, this little arrow thing, the complex form of that what do you think I mean? That's right. A is, I'm just calling it a lay without the underline. This means complex, complex number now. AX plus IAY. It's the usual isomorphism between R2 and the complex plane. Okay, let's do a little... Uh, <coughs> Another exercise. Just suppose, yeah, if it's a physical quantity, I need it to be real. All, I'm all I meant only there is that if you're a mathematician, you don't necessarily, you, you study harmonic functions, so it's, so it's, there's no constraint to reality. See, people study analytic function theory, which is just functions that you just see, and then there's also harmonic function theory, which is some function of z, analytic function plus an anti-analytic function, but they don't necessarily have to be real. Right, um, question or exercise. Again, it amazes me that what I'm going to show you now doesn't appear really in the textbooks. You have to really search for it. very natural question. Everybody discusses this isomorphism between R2 and the complex plane, but then when you actually start doing applied complex analysis and you need things like dot products and cross products, uh, you have to work out all the formulae from scratch. What's the dot? I suppose A and B are two vectors. Okay, so in other words, A is AX, AY, and B is BX, BY. We want to work out what the dot product is a scalar, obviously. What I'm asking here is, I know, we know, so here we go, we know that A goes to A in complex form and B goes to B. But what does A dot B go, go to? What's the complex form? This is the question mark. What's here? Anybody else? What's the dot product in terms of the coordinates? You remember it's AX times BX plus AY times BY. That's the dot product of two vectors. How do I write that thing in terms of little a and little b without the underline? So these are complex numbers now. You need to extract the dot product. Well, obviously, you th you're thinking of multiplying A and B together, aren't you? But if you multiply A and B together, you, you get AX. First of all, you get a complex number. But secondly, if you multiply, the, you get AX times BX is <coughs> part of the real part. And then the other bit of the real part has a minus AY, BY, which is not what you need. If you want AX, BX plus AY, BY. So what's the fix?
you multiply these two together, you get AX BX minus AY BY plus some imaginary stuff. But how about I multiply A by B bar? And take the real part. Or indeed, A bar times B. And take the real part. Either would work. So that's it. Anybody seen that before? You don't see it very often. <laughs> if, uh, if you're, uh, if you're in curious like me, I've just formed this funny combination, A times B bar. And the real part's the dot product. Anybody know what the imaginary part is? It's the cross product. I won't, I won't write that down because uh, actually we might need that later if we work out torques. <coughs> Remember torques are cross products of X cross with forces. Okay, so uh, let me just make note. I'll just make a brief note. Ever is related to a cross beam. I can't possibly give you a crash course in low Reynolds number Stokes flows unless I first give you a crash course in ideal flows. You'll see why. So here's a uh, one, one board crash course in ideal flow theory, which you might have seen if you've done a basic course in fluid mechanics or first course in fluid mechanics, you normally see this thing. This is crash course in ideal flow, ideal irrotational Compressible 2D flows. So I'm going to summarize the whole course in two lines. So um, incompressible implies that the divergence of U is zero in two dimensions. And we've already seen that we can introduce the stream function. Saw that earlier. With u being the y derivative and v being the negative x derivative. If we, uh, ideal just means that there's no viscosity. So uh, we haven't done irrotational yet. Irrotational is equivalent to saying that the curl of the velocity is zero. Vorticity is zero. Irrotational. <coughs> If you've got a curl-free operator in 2D, curl-free vector field in 2D, uh, subject to some regularity conditions, you can prove that there exists a potential phi such that, and we're gonna call this a velocity potential, uh, if you were doing electrostatics, and everything here is analogous to electrostatics, uh, we would call this a, 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 um, just an electric potential or field potential. Uh, such that u is grad phi. Okay, you can clearly see that the curl of this is, all, is automatically zero. Okay. And this one implies that u is dt by dx and v is dt by dy. So, long story short, you've got ideal, incompressible, irrotational two-dimensional flow, 
there's a stream function because it's incompressible, and there's a uh, velocity potential because it's irrotational. And look what happens. U and V can be written like this in terms of phi or this in terms of psi, but you need these to be consistent. So for consistency, we need this to be equal to this. And this to be equal to this. What are these? It's the good old Cauchy-Riemann equations. which means that there's a, uh, an, uh, an analytic function sitting in the background, which we'll call the complex potential. So um, hence, uh, we let y plus i psi be w of z, which we call the complex potential. In this case, of the flow. So uh, Kim, was it? Kim was just asking uh, why I was saying the flow domain. The, the point is that I'm basing this course in a fluid dynamics application. So instead of, you know, just domains D, where everything's completely arbitrary, I'm thinking in the future I'm going to be solving flow problems. So instead of D, I'm going to say fluid domains. This is where the flow is. Okay. So uh, this we're calling it. That's it. That's ideal flow theory. Ideal irritational flow. There's a very important theorem in complex analysis called Liouville's theorem. Can anybody tell me what it is? you it's a it's an it's a theorem about analytic functions and it says the following if you have an, a function g w say which is analytic but it's analytic everywhere in the complex plane and it's bounded at infinity guess what w of z must be you know it's a constant. It has to be a constant. There's no other <coughs> choices. So any W of Z that is analytic <coughs> everywhere in the complex line. I use this to do, by the way, some people call these entire functions. Just the definition of what we mean by an entire function. Um, <coughs> and bounded at infinity, it is necessarily constant. That's very disappointing, isn't it? If you're a fluid dynamicist who uh, is interested in ideal irrotational flows, and you just realized that instead of thinking of these flows, you can now think of analytic functions instead, first question you ask yourself is, ah, suppose I've got irrotational, incompressible flow everywhere in the plane, and it doesn't blow up at infinity, what possible flows can I have? I'll say that again. I've got an ideal, incompressible, irrotational flow everywhere in this plane, and it doesn't blow up at infinity. I want to know, I want to study that class of flows. What's the, what's the only thing I'm studying? Troop no flow. That's what this says, because remember, oh, I haven't, I haven't shown you one thing. I need to know how to get the velocity from these potentials. Right? 
So I suppose I've got W. Let me just so let me put this as an exercise. Uh, remember, U was grad B. Okay. So uh, oh, let's just do it. It's so simple. So let's think about U plus I minus I V. That's the V by the uh, X minus I D V by the Y. Isn't it? Because this is true. So u minus iv, I've just put a minus sign, so I know it's the relevant one, uh, at d5 of the x minus i d5 of the y. So let me take out the 5. Uh, what's this, my friends? Got a minus. So it's the d by dz. So in fact, this is 2 d by dz, and phi, by the way, is the real part of w. So it's w of z plus the conjugate of that, all divided by 2, which is see how important that 2 was from this operator? Because these 2's cancel. What's dw by dz of w of z? It's just w prime of z, or dw by dz, whatever you want to call it. And then this one's just an anti-analytic function. We know that, don't we? It's anti-analytic, so that doesn't give us anything when we take a d derivative with z bar fixed. So that's why I put u minus iv, because for these flows, if you've got the complex potential w, just get the velocity field, you just take a derivative. <coughs> Okay, so uh, this is something we, we just want to keep in our heads. This is for ideal irritation flows. Uh, why was I doing that? Oh, because I've just decided from Neuville's theorem that if I want to study irritational incompressible flows in the entire plane, W is a constant, according to Neuville, which means that the W by dz is zero. So all the flows, there's no flow. So Neuville's theorem tells me that if I want to study two-dimensional incompressible irritational flows, they're only non-trivial if what? What are my choices? What can I do now? What can I do now to study these flows? I've got to break Neuville's theorem. So how can I do it? Remember, Neuville's theorem required me to be analytic everywhere in the complex plane. So I can think of two things I can do to mess that up. One is to not consider the whole plane. You just consider a half plane or a subregion of the plane then Liebel's theorem doesn't apply. See? So I'm saying now I've got some fluid domain, but it's not the whole plane. It's just a bit of it. That's one thing I can do. Then hopefully I'll get something interesting. Uh, what else can I do if I don't want to, if I want to consider the whole plane? So I don't want to cut off bits of the domain. I want to keep the whole plane, but I still want to break Liebel's theorem. What's another option? theorem tells me if it's analytic everywhere in the plane, boring. I still want the flow everywhere in the plane, but it can't be analytic everywhere. So as a mathematician, the next thing I would consider is to just pick a point and let it lose analyticity. And see what I get. <coughs> I could pick a curve or a whole region and let it lose out. The simplest thing is to pick a point. So, uh, 
what's your favorite uh, isolated complex singularity? It's an analytic function, but it loses analyticity a point. What's your favorite singularity? So. <coughs> there we go. We're going to break analyticity uh, to circumvent Newman's theorem. I'll tell you what. Uh, we can do, we can do, and this is what they do in the textbooks. They then go through and they show you all the different types of singularity, of analytic functions, and they give them a physical interpretation. You see, complex analysts, for example, would say set uh, W of Z to be, let me just pick a log. Actually, this isn't isolated. Uh, at a point. Pick this one. And gamma is a real, real constant. Uh, if you were a complex analyst, how would you describe the singularities of this function? Well, uh, in this case, you say that, you see, if you could ever see a log, you look at where the argument of the log is zero or blows up, and then you're going to have a logarithmic branch point singularity. So here you've got one at uh, a branch point at z naught, and where else? At infinity. Z blows up at infinity. We've got a branch point at z naught and infinity. Okay, uh, so here we go. Here's our plane. Look, here's z naught, and I'll tell you what. Let's pick a. Let's give this physical interpretation. So we we want a physical interpretation. Uh, in fluid dynamics. Uh, by the way, everything I say has interpretations in. Elasticity in electrostatics and magnetostatics, which is different physical interpretation. I'm talking about ideal flow. So we want physical interpretation. So let me pick a curve C that encloses uh, Z uh, naught. Now, there's a quantity that fluid dynamicists uh, obsess about. It's called the circulation. If, you, if, you, if you've got a flow and you just draw a curve in it, you can ask, uh, you can kind of project the velocity field along the curve and add up all the contributions. It's called the circ gives you a kind of sense of how things are swirling around a point. So let's uh, define the circulation around C to be this thing. As I just said, you go all the way around C, you project, uh, so sorry, here's C, so look, here's a typical, here's a typical tangent, and remember, the velocity field there might be there, going that way, locally. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna project, I'm gonna look at the components going along this tangent vector, and then add up so you see, it kind of gives me a sense of how things are going around the curve, how much fluid is going around this curve. So I'm going to project it with the local tangent. Tangent number. Okay. You're right, Rodri. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look what I'm going to do now. had to do that, didn't I? Because fluid dynamicists tell me that this is the physical quantity that they are interested in, 
but I'm asked, I will only know about the flow written in terms of this complex variable formulator. So I have to ask, how do I compute this in complex variable form? Well, I already told you earlier how to complexify the dot product. That's why I told you. What was it again? Well, uh, I'll tell you what, what's the complexification of u? Well, that's just u plus iv. And what's the complexification of dx? Well, remember, dx is just dx dy in a vector. So what's dx plus i dy? It's dz. And remember what the dot product was? I'm still going around C, albeit in the complex plane now. U dot dx, remember what I had to do? I had to take the real part of the conjugate of one of these multiplied by the other one. Everyone remember? Well, so real part needs to go in there. I'm gonna pick the conjugate of this one, Y. The conjugate of this one, by the way, is of course U minus IV. Kim knows why, but I've erased it. It's because dw by dz was u minus iv. Remember? So real part of u minus, let me write it down, right? dz. Okay, the conjugate of the, one of them times the other one. But this one's dw by dz. Look how beautiful this is, everybody. Look, uh, <coughs> it's just asking to be done. Look, it's this, this is dw by dz, and then there's a dz. I could cancel those out if you wanted. In fact, I will. This is the real part of uh, the integral. Oh my goodness, look at this. It's the real part of uh, the integral of a differential. Isn't it beautiful? What's the integral of a differential? It's just the, ch if I go around the curve, uh, well, first of all, suppose W was single valued. What would the answer be? Nothing. Right, because these are kind of you know, derivative integration. So this is the real part of, some people like to use this. Change in W as you go around C. And if W doesn't change as you go around C because it's single value, then there's no circulation. What's the circulation of our W? We all have to remember now when we first met the complex logarithm. Uh, remember, I called, that's why I put the branch. That's why I wanted to think of something branched, because I wanted it to have non-zero circulation. What's the change in? Uh, Logarithm as I go around the branch point. Let's just look at log at the origin. Isn't this? Don't you remember this? Complex logarithm. Log mod is perfectly single valued. The real part is perfectly single valued. But the argument of z as you go around the origin changes by 2 pi. So log z is going to change by 2 pi i. And the same thing's gonna be here if I move it to Z naught. So it, this becomes, uh, remember, and also I've got the minus I over uh, gamma, gamma over two pi, which by the way is just gamma over two pi I. All right, so the answer here is just gamma. Come on, see? Because the logarithm changes by two pi I. Notice, by the way, 
that that was independent of the curve, as long as it enclosed. What would the answer be, by the way, if C did not enclose the Z naught? So I suppose I did this one. Suppose that was the curve. Still the same thing. What's the change in W as I go around the yellow curve? Zero, right? Because I could always, it's a single value, unless I go around the branch point. Because I could always pick the branch cut to be away from the yellow curve. Think of it like that. So, I've got a flow governed by this complex potential. With, there's this little point sitting in my plane at Z naught. And if I draw a curve around, any old curve, going around, enclosing Z naught, I get gamma for the circulation. I miss it, I get nothing. So that reminds me of a delta function. If you, if, you, if you cover it, you get something. If you don't, you don't get anything. You get zero. And so we call this a point vortex because you've got circulation kind of uh, sitting at a single point. Okay, so we call this, we call Okay, so uh, for a general flow with a point vortex at Z naught, near Z naught, the complex potential W looks like this. got circulation gamma. Okay, so the point is, if there's, a, if there's some general flow and you've got, uh, you know, here we go, some general flow, whatever, I'm not cross with the screen lights, and I've got a point vortex sitting there, then near here, the complex potential has got to look in some neighborhood of Z naught, like the singularity, the point vortex, Plus, uh, some other flow. This analytic near near ana this is analytic at z naught. This is just this is just near z naught. Okay. So in some neighbourhood, because who knows? There might be other point vortices over here, and their singularities would sit in there. But locally near to z naught, there'd be. Now, I'm going to completely uh, not derive this, but uh, you, can, you can derive an equation of motion for these point vortices under the assumption that they're force-free, okay, which is normally what you do if you're modeling you know, hurricanes or kind of intrinsic vortices in a flow. Then they're force-free. They just move around according to the equation of motion. Some people call this Helmholtz laws. Helmholtz law is a vortex motion. So I'm not going to derive this. I'm just going to tell you the answer. The d by dt of z naught bar is the w hat by dz evaluated as z naught. Now, that, this takes two or three pages to derive. You have to use basically uh, 
the so-called Euler equations for drivers, which is completely not what we're studying, because we're studying the completely different limit of Stokes equations. But this comes from Euler. So in other words, when you take the Reynolds number to be infinity, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I just want to derive this because I want to use this to show you some uh, dynamical techniques that we will then go on to use in Stokes flows. Okay? So I'm just going to give you a simpler context in which to study these things. So look what happens. If I've got some flow, and we'll do an example now, um, what I have to do is if you give me a flow and there's a point vortex at Z0, I can work out how it evolves according to this. This is an ODE. It's an ODE because I have to solve for W hat and then take its derivative and evaluate it as Z0. And then that's an ODE. Okay, so. Let's do an example over here. Now, uh, some of you will have seen this before, uh, but I don't care because uh, it's very instructive. And in particular, we're going to learn lots of things about this that we'll then use in Stokes flows. And I'm pretty sure you wouldn't have seen that before. So here we go. I've got a wall along that real axis. And here's a point vortex. It's circulation, it's got circulation around it, and it's a Z0. So, <coughs> how does it move? Well, that's the question. Well, this is the ODE that will tell me how it moves, and you can see the thing I need here. The only thing I don't know is W hat. And I only know W hat if I know W. So I've got to find W. So let's do that first. So. Find the complex potential. And it's an analytic function that we have to determine. We need, this is what we need. One, near Z naught. I can write There's one other thing I need. Look what this is doing. Imagine a little, little hurricane here, swirling fluid very quickly around it. And in fact, it gets infinitely fast as you go in. Uh, but the point is, uh, we've got a wall here that's impenetrable. You, you can't have flow going through the wall. So we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. That's the boundary condition in W. And um, let me just put it this way. Um, you can show quite easily that uh, one way to state that is that uh, for no flow through the wall, <coughs> this is impenetrable, we need the imaginary part of the complex potential, which by the way is a stream function, to be constant. And without loss of generality, we can set it to be zero. Okay. It's 
I, I haven't been through all the details, but it turns out that the, the contours of the stream function are the stream lines. In other words, the, the, the lines on which the flow goes. So what you want to see is you want this to be a stream line. So you want it to be a contour of psi. Psi is the imaginary part of W, so let it be zero contour. I don't want to spend too much time on the derivation. It's more the mathematics of how we solve this that I'm interested in. OK. Uh, equivalently, if the imaginary part of the complex potential is zero, it means that the complex potential is real on, on the real axis. We'll stop again in a couple of minutes once I've just asked you to think about this. In fact, this is a perfect thing for you to think about in the uh, short break. How we're going to find W hat, or W, W, because once we know W, we can uh, get W hat. We need to construct an analytic function that has this singularity z naught and is real on the real axis. That's the challenge. Okay. I'm just going to have another cup of tea, and I'll be back. Uh, we'll start again at five past. And as I said, I'm sure all of you will be <laughs> telling me what the answer is. Let me show you how to do this. Let's let W of S, S meaning S, S for singular, be the thing, the thing we need in the singularity there. So just this function. OK? That's the singularity we need, the singular part of the function. But we also need the complex potential to be real on the real axis. Now, here's a guess. I know that if I take the, singu the singular part that I need and add its complex conjugate, then that's real, isn't it? It's that plus its complex conjugate. That's real. And it's got the singularity I need. But what's the problem with it? <laughs> yes, it's not analytic. So it can't be a complex potential. Remember, a complex potential has got to be an analytic function with the required singularity at z naught and have a constant uh, uh, be real on the real axis. That's got two of the three, but it's not analytic. But notice the following. The function I've written down there is real everywhere. But I only need it to be real on the real axis. Where, by the way, z bar is equal to z. So can anybody think of a simple fix to make this the solution? This has the right singularity. It's real, certainly on the real axis, but it's also real everywhere else. So the main problem is it's not analytic because of this. Look at the power of complex analysis. I'm going to form the solution now because I only want it to be real on the real axis where z bar is equal to z, which means that I can change this z to z bar 
it's still real there, but now I've made it analytic. And now it satisfies everything. It's analytic, it's got the right singularity, it's real on the axis. Moreover, what is this function, my friends? Now you know what it is. It's the Schwartz conjugate function. You see, do you see what I'm trying to say? Why did you not know what they were before? Because they arise everywhere. So in other words, the solution to this problem is W of S, the singular part, plus its Schwartz conjugate function. Let's just see what that looks like, because I can just substitute it in now. And you'll find, uh, by the way, <laughs> I should have said this earlier. By the way, there's a beautifully simple way to generate the Schwartz conjugate function. Right, look, let me show you. Suppose that's P of Z. Remember what I was doing this earlier. P bar of Z, you know what you do? You look for all the complex numbers. You, you leave Z alone. You look for all the complex numbers in there and you conjugate them. So if this is P of Z, P bar of Z is one, is conjugate one plus i is minus i, I leave z alone. 1 plus 2iz. And look what I've done here. W of s is that. So to get the Schwartz conjugate, I've got an i there, minus i there, so I change it to plus i. And I've got a z naught, which is a complex number there. I just change it to z naught bar. That's the Schwartz conjugate. Remember, every time you see complex constants, you leave z alone. But every time you see complex constants, you conjugate them. That's the Schwartz conjugate. By the way, this is our original point vortex. What is this? <coughs> you see, this is the answer. This is the solution. How can you interpret the, so, oh, by the way, and this is also W hat. W hat is precisely the thing that you add to WS to get the answer. <coughs> but we can interpret this physically, can't we? Because this looks very similar to WS, except it's a point vortex. It's a point vortex. But where is the point vortex? It's on the reflected point, and it's the opposite side. Okay? So you see what's happening here. Physically, this thing's swirling anticlockwise. And then in bigger and bigger circles, the circles are getting distorted because the walls stop it. There's no penetration through the wall. So we've got these circular streamlines. And then what's happening is everything's being forced to go along the wall. But another way to force that is to look at the reflected points in or bar and have it rotate the other way. So then everything is symmetrically uh, canceling out on the axis. It's a physical interpretation of what I did. So I have an opposite sign uh, minus gamma at the reflected point. Let's quickly work out what the dynamics is. Well, we go to here. We call this a triangle. So W hat of Z, we've just decided is I gamma over two pi. That, so it'd be W hat of Z is I gamma over two pi. Therefore, according to, well, the triangle implies that. Goodness, okay, I've just taken the uh, derivative of um, the W hat evaluated it at uh, Z naught, and that's my OD. We need to solve that. Uh, by the way, it's a, it's a nonlinear ODE, first order. 
but it's complex. So really, it's two coupled first order real ODEs. Okay, but I've got a little trick here. Let's take the complex conjugate. Let's call this one. Let's take the complex conjugate. Then we've got d z naught by d t is minus i gamma over two pi, one over z naught bar minus z naught. And you notice, look, that if you, this gives you a minus sign, it gives you exactly what's on the right-hand side there. So if you subtract one and two, okay? So what it tells you is that uh, z naught minus z naught bar is constant or the imaginary part of z naught is constant. And that means that the vortex moves at a constant distance from the wall. In fact, you can show, so in fact, you can show that it moves at constant speed. But what happens is uh, what you get here is uh, this stays fixed, this is b, so it's b, say, set by initial conditions, and then it moves at constant speed u. And it's very easy to determine u because u comes from putting, um, this of course will be 2ib, right, because the magic part of b is in that, it's true, let's put it in there. So u is equal to z naught bar by t, u is i gamma over 2 pi, 1 over z naught minus z naught bar, which is this. So that's it. We've just solved the problem of what a point vortex does near a wall. It stays at a constant distance from the wall and moves at constant speed parallel to it. Okay. Any questions? Fluid dynamicists. Uh, fluid dynamicists like to think of, you see, basically, point vortices move uh, in, the, in the flow generated by the other sources of vorticity, <coughs> which is here. So in a sense, because this is going around like that, look, it's sweeping that one in that direction, and then uh, this also gets swept in that direction, so they both kind of travel parallel to the wall. Let's just test you here. Uh, this is a very important calculation I'm going to show you here. It's, it, it's the calculation for the uh, trailing vortices of aircraft when they take off. A good model for that, very good uh, leading order model. Okay, so the plane's on the runway, it's just taken off. What it, it leaves two trailing vortices of opposite sides. So generally, you've basically got um, things like this, or it might be the other way around. Whatever, let's just take this. So you've got two vortices near a one, one way. And you want to know how they move. How they move is critical for airports all around the world because that's how they schedule the next aircraft. They want to make sure it's moved away sufficiently far to not cause a smaller aircraft taking off behind it. By the way, this happened to me. Actually, where was I flying? It was a couple of months ago. We were descending. I think we were coming into London Heathrow. And... Uh, uh, we, we would, I don't know, you, you would see, see out the window, we, I don't know, maybe a, a, not too high up, a few thousand feet, uh, and suddenly there was this huge bump. We all got shook, shaken up. Very, the most serious I've ever experienced in an aircraft. Suddenly, all of us, thank goodness we had our seatbelts on, but we just suddenly had a huge, you know, we all jolted. And because it was so serious, when we landed, the, 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 the um, pilot didn't say anything when it happened, but when we landed, he explained what it was. And it was because we come in too early 
from a much bigger aircraft in front of us. And we basically felt uh, the wake of the other aircraft because we come in too quickly. So you can see how critical these calculations are. Uh, but anyway, uh, one way of uh, thinking of this problem is because these are basically plus minus of the same strength, you can consider this equivalently as the problem of a single point vortex in a quarter plane. So let's just ask ourselves, this is a quick calculation. What's W here? So this is a point vortex in a quarter plane. What's W? And I'm going to give you this example because I'm going to do it two ways. So I need I need the singularity <coughs> plus W hat. And by the way, everything's the difference of what I was doing before because it's a new, new problem. With imaginary part of W is zero on uh, Z bar is equal to Z, as before. This one. And also this one, which is X is equal to zero. Uh, how can we state uh, this one? This is, of course, z bar is equal to minus z. Okay. So this is, if you like, example two. Should we try the method I just told, showed you? I'll do it. I'll do it this way. You remember this little trick here? Let's, in fact, let's pretend we've just repeated this. This is all the same, but let's call this thing W one of Z. Okay. So this answer is W one of Z, and we know that that has right singularity, and it satisfies this one. But it doesn't satisfy this one. Okay, so I've re I'm doing this new calculation, I've gone this far. What do you think I should do next? Got a function, W1, that has the right singularity and satisfies the boundary conditions on here. But it doesn't satisfy the boundary conditions on there. But it should be real on there as well. So what do you think I should do? Why don't I try the same trick? So now I consider W1 of Z, because that, that's working well for me. But, uh, and I'm going to try this other thing. This, the thing's real now, but it's real everywhere. But it's not analytic. So it fails. It's not the right response. I need to fix this. What do I do now? This is real everywhere, but I only need it to be real now on the imaginary axis, where z is equal to minus z bar. Since on the imaginary axis, z is equal to minus z bar, why don't I just replace that z by minus z bar? Thereby making it real, keeping it real there, but also making it analytic. Simple, isn't it? Let me just check. Let me just write it down. W1 is that. As is W1, look what I've got to do now. I've basically got to, uh, l l let's think of it this way. It's W1 bar of minus Z. Okay, so Schwartz conjugate of this would be plus, remember, Schwartz conjugate 
means you leave z alone, but you conjugate everything else. But now I'm evaluating the Schwartz conjugate because this, remember, this is w1 bar of minus z. But I'm not going to leave z alone because I've got to make it minus z. So that means I get a minus z in there. And then, again, it's Schwartz conjugate, but then with z goes to minus z. So Schwartz conjugate means conjugate all the, all the numbers, change that to a minus z, and change that to a z. I'm doing it quickly because I've had done this a lot. But just you'll see that it's very simple. And by the way, look at this. I've got a pl think of this as log of uh, minus one times z plus z naught bar. But then I've got minus uh, log of minus one z plus z naught. So I think you'll you can see that this is just um, In other words, I can, I can make all of these uh, minus signs and pluses. You can just check this. And what it means is, if I've got a plus point vortex there, I've got the, the minus one uh, z naught bar. And then I actually have a minus one here at minus z naught bar. And then a plus one here at uh, minus z naught. Just go through this yourself. You'll, you'll see it all works out. It's just the same method as before. I'm going to show you another method, though. No, it's always, remember, you're, you're confusing the, it's the, yeah, you're confusing Z and W, right? The real part of Z is zero, because that's the axis. But the real part of W, we don't know. It's the imaginary part of W that has to be zero on both. Okay, don't confuse Z, which is the boundary, with the, the answer on that boundary. I'm going to show you another way to do it, which is very powerful. Um, I'm sure you've heard of conformal mapping. Have you? A few people are nodding, but I only ask that. No, I don't really care. Because uh, conformal mappings are just geometrical interpretations of analytic functions. That's all they are. So if you haven't heard of conformal mappings, forget it. What we're going to do is the following thing. Let's take the, the upper half plane, where we know the answer is this. Can anybody think of an analytic change of variables? That's all I'm doing. Another change of variables. Remember, I start the whole course. I started saying it's just a change of variables. Now I'm going to do a more sophisticated change of variables from the z-plane to another plane. Can anybody think of a, a, an analytic function that will move under the function all <coughs> points that I've shaded in the upper half plane to the quarter plane? So that's the origin. And let's call this, uh, say, a zeta plane. And of course, uh, if, I, if I can do that, wherever my point vortex is, we'll go to some zeta naught here. Under this, under this axis. 
And the crucial point is, I want it to be an analytic map, analytic function. Not any old function, an analytic function. Well, how about this? Um, nice, nice way to think of this is we know that uh, if this is the what they call the polar representation of Z, when you take a square root, uh, you're going to get r to the half e to the i theta over two. Okay. So look what happens if theta is equal to zero, so that I'm on this ray, theta going to have argument that's also zero. So uh, this is going to map to this <coughs> under this, corris this analytic correspondence. What about this one? Well, on here, the argument of z is pi. So what's the argument of zeta? It's i pi by 2. Well, it's e to the i pi by 2, so the argument is pi by 2. So that maps to this. You want to see? And you can see, right, that um, all rays in between will map to other rays. Everything gets squashed like a fan. What did I call this? I called this the solution. Anybody think? So, so remember, look what we've got to find here. Uh, we need to find uh, what we're calling this W2 of zeta, such that it is analytic in zeta. <coughs> Imaginary part W2 is zero on both boundaries. That's it. Oh, and. Uh, w2 looks like Okay, those are the three things we need to find. Can anybody think of a way to generate it? Given that we know the answer over there. about this. So this is the question mark. And look, by the way, look, look, everybody. W1 is an, an I want an analytic function of zeta. But W1 is already an analytic function of z. And because I've made sure that my correspondence between this plane and this plane is through an analytic function itself, I can compose analytic functions. So why don't I do this? So what I'm saying is, this is certainly a function of zeta, an analytic function of zeta, because z, I'm thinking of this as now as, uh, you know, I, I, by the way, another way of writing this, of course, is that z is equal to zeta squared. That's what I mean. That's this analytic correspondence between these two planes. And then I'm just uh, putting W1, which I already know, because it's over there. Let's check these conditions. Is this an analytic function of zeta inside the domain? Yes, by, in, by composition. Is it? Got it, has it got zero imaginary part on both boundaries? 
Well, I know that red corresponds to red, where W1 is zero imaginary part. And yellow corresponds to yellow, where W1 has zero imaginary part. And W2 is just W1 of those places. So yes. I still need to check this, but it's the only thing to do. But in this case, let's just look. Well, W2 of zeta look is uh, that we're suggesting, where z is zeta squared, and we're going to put it in there. Oh, by the way, g to naught squared is v naught. So they mapped under the same correspondence. Uh. But I can factorize these things, can't I? Or rather, I don't know which way to do it, you see? Can everybody see that if I just swap, if I just let zeta be z here now? Because remember, this was the solution assuming that uh, this was z. Can everybody see that I've generated the same answer? Because look, if I put, these, if I put that one together with that one, I get z squared minus z naught squared. And this together with this one gives me z squared minus z naught bar squared. Those are the two factors I have to have. Everybody see? Nice, isn't it? Some people call this step conformal mapping. But that just makes it more complicated as far as I'm concerned. It's just a, 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 an analytic, it's just an analytic map between uh, two complex planes. That's all it is. The other reason I like the second approach is uh, the following. You'll read in lots of textbooks uh, things like method of images. Come across that? You've probably come across it in electrostatics as well. Uh, lots of physicists love it. You know, the point being that, you know, if I've got a plus charge here, then let me put a minus charge there to, to make this an equipotential, and then I'll put a minus charge there to make that an equipotential. But then, kind of, because there's a minus there, I kind of need, and a minus there, I kind of need a plus there. I don't like that, because as soon as you change this angle to something else, the whole thing just becomes, you, I don't, you lose track. But everything I did in the second approach here goes over. In fact, I've just got time in this lecture to show you what I mean. Because this is a beautiful example of how uh, unhelpful, let me be generous, unhelpful the method of images is. Here's something you ought to think about. We decided, didn't we, that if we put a point vortex near a half plane, it travels at constant speed along the wall. Here's my wall, here's my little point vortex, and it's, uh, actually let's change the, yeah, no, that's right, plus will move this way, with that speed we worked out. Okay, it will just carry. Everyone following? Now look, suppose that at some point here, the wall stops. And there's a gap, and it continues on forever over there. So in other words, suppose there's a gap in the wall. What does the vortex do now? Now think about this. Remember our original problem? We put a point vortex there, and we, we kind of sh showed that there was a, a kind of an image vortex here, a z0 bar, 
we can kind of produce, forcing it to go that way. That's an interpretation of the solution. And we didn't care if there was another point vortex down here, because this is a big warp. This is just a solid object. Now, there's fluid in here. And there's fluid up here. The whole thing is full of fluid, except for this warp. Now think about this. Suppose the vortex is over there, a long way from the gap. Physically speaking, we know that it will not feel the influence of the gap, which means that it's going to travel towards the gap at constant, roughly constant speed. Feeling the influence of this image vortex, which is this, like its reflection in the wall, isn't it? That's what we decided over here, look, is the image vortex. And it moves there because this is kind of pushing it that way. Think about this. When I'm far from this gap, that's still got to be true, but I can't put an image vortex here because there's fluid there and it would change my problem. I can't do it, but it's got to be true. Physical grounds, if nothing else. Everybody follow me? So here's the problem, and this is why mathematics in complex analysis is so beautiful, because physically you know that far from this gap, the, the thing's got to move in response to its image, but you can't put the image there. It just means you're changing the physical problem, because you'll have two vortices in the fluid. So we have a conundrum. And by the way, when I start coming, when this thing starts coming close to the wall, any guesses about what it will do? Well, let's think physically. Suppose this, in fact, let's put, put it in plus minus one. We've set the gap width. What's going to happen if I start, my vortex comes in way up here? In other words, in other words, its distance from the wall is a lot greater than the size of the gap. What do you think will happen if it comes in up here? Well, it's going to keep coming in. Right? It'll be moving quite slowly, because remember, it was gamma over two pi, 4 pi b, where b was this distance. So if b gets bigger, it's moved more slowly, but it still moves. Right? And it's going to come in, and then, of course, it's going to start getting close to the, kind of close to the gap. It's going to feel the gap, but probably not much, because this is a lot bigger than this. So I suspect it might kind of dip, or maybe go up, I don't know. We'll work it out. It will feel, it will change its straight line path here, a little bit. And then probably carry on as before. On the other hand, if I'm down here, very close to the wall, I'm of course going to travel very fast towards the gap. And then what do you think I might do? We don't know, do we? So we have to use mathematics to tell us. <coughs> but I'm a little bit concerned about this whole images thing because I like to think the image is there, but it can't be. But it's got to be. By the way, I kind of liked my second method here. Finding this analytic change of variables that, in a sense, made an analytic correspondence between the fluid domain I'm interested in, which was a quarter plane here, but now it's this domain. It's the whole of this. Wouldn't it be nice 
if I could find a change of variables that takes this upper half plane <coughs> to that. Because then I could do exactly what I did here and I think everything will work. And it does. So all I have to do is to find the analytic change of variables from the half plane, up half plane, to the half plane with a gap. Some people call that a conformal mapping problem. Great thing is, it's all we have to do. By the way, I'm sorry I haven't got round to do any Stokes flows today, but um, fortunately, this was the last thing I was intending to do on uh, the background for the ideal flows, so we'll start on Friday. Stokes flows. And by the way, all of the ideas that I've used here, I'm going to use in Stokes flows. So while the equations are slightly different, the, the, the technique, the, the basic ideas are the same, which is why I'm taking you through this, because there's no way we'll understand it with the swimmers if we don't understand it here. Um, one of the most famous conformal maps, anybody know any conformal maps? They, some of the most famous ones have names. It's named after famous people. They're on Wikipedia. Oh, the the seeds are just Okay, Wikipedia homework. Here's one. Guess what this one does? It's just this. It's clearly analytic function. Z as a function of zeta is clearly analytic. Obviously, it blows up at minus one, so it's not analytic there, actually. Uh, but do you know what this does? Suppose, uh, let's suppose zeta is this unit circle, unit disk. Where does the zeta is equal to naught go to in a z-plane? One. Where does uh, one go to? Zero. And where does minus one go to? Infinity. Let me just do something for you. Let's, um, let's consider Z bar for zeta on the unit circle. By the way, this is always a good thing to do. If you're trying to work out what the, what the image of a line or circle is in a, under some uh, analytic change of variable, a good thing is to take a conjugate. So uh, let's just look. By the way, uh, we know that on here, Z bar is what? If I'm on the unit circle in the zeta plane, zeta bar is what? <coughs> it's one over zeta, isn't it? Because this is, uh, this is mod zeta is equal to one, which is the same as mod zeta squared is equal to one, which is zeta times conjugate zeta. So that's true. Now, let me take, uh, so in other words, I'm going to take z bar. The z bar, of course, is uh, one minus zeta bar over one plus zeta bar, but I'm on but I'm on this circle, so I'm going to put one over one over zeta, one plus one over zeta, multiply it by zeta, and I'm going to fall off the precipice. I multiply top and bottom by zeta, and what's this? Mod 
minus z. So on this circle, under this correspondence, z bar is minus z, and we all know that that corresponds to what? Imaginary axis. Z bar is equal to z is the real axis, z bar is minus z is the imaginary axis. In other words, let's get my yellow short here. This maps to this. And in fact, the whole of the inside maps to the right half. That's a famous map because a lot of theorems for simply connected uh, complex analysis, they say that it doesn't matter whether you state them in the unit disk or in the upper half plane, it, because they're conformally equivalent through the Cayley map. That's fine, it says the same thing. Up to the, in terms of analytic function. Okay. Here's another one. By the way, look it up in Wikipedia, you'll see. Uh, talking about airplanes earlier. It was in the early days of uh, air, aircraft and f air flight, uh, when there were no computers. The, I can't emphasize enough how important the Joukowsky map was uh, to allow people to do kind of estimates of lifts on aerofoils and things like that. Uh, does anybody know what that one does? Let me show you what it is first. I'll put a half there, but you don't need the half. Well, let's see where this goes. Where does the origin go to? Infinity. Um, and, ah, look at this. What, think about this circle. We know that on this circle, zeta bar is one over zeta. So, this is zeta bar on the, on the yellow circle. So on the yellow circle, z is a half, zeta plus zeta bar, a number plus its complex conjugate. So what do we know about z when we're on the yellow circle? Real. In other words, what happens is the following, uh, and that's why the, uh, it was so important in aerodynamics, it, to a slit between, by the way, when, when it's one, it's one. And when it's minus one, it's minus one. So in other words, it maps to, to the, the thing between minus one and plus one. And I, remember, this point maps to infinity, so it maps to all of this. By the way, you can just check that this upper semicircle maps to the bottom half of the slit, and then when you go around there, it goes back over the top. But it's all sitting on the real axis. Does everyone understand? So what happens is, as you go, follow, follow me, I'm gonna try and coordinate. <coughs> okay, as I go around like this, I go like this. And then I go like this. So it closes up, although you, it, it's kind of flat. It's a, it's a plate. that again. If I go up here, I go down to the other end of the slit, and as I come back, I go back on myself. And everything inside goes to the whole thing outside. Now, we've nearly finished, because I found a very useful map, it's called a Zikowski map, famous one, that maps the unit disk to the region outside a slit between plus and minus one. I also, by the way, can use the Cayley map to map analytically the disk to the half plane. So I can map, use the inverse Cayley map to map the half plane to the disk. I can then use the Joukowsky map to map the disk to this slit. I've got one more step to get to that.
I need this yellow thing to go to this yellow thing. And it's got to be analytic. There are no conjugates or anything. Anybody see? Let's call this eta. How can I map that to that by just an analytic function of eta? Okay, what did you say? One over eta. Because look what will happen. One will map to one. So the edge here will map to that corner. Minus one will map to the other edge. And then at z zero will map to infinity. And everything in here, you see, so what happened is it'll invert everything. So that will stay where it is, but everything there will go out here. And as I cl close the origin, it will go way out here. By the way, when I go through the origin here, I'm going to go all the way around infinity and come out there and come in to minus one through analytic change of the variable. So that's the mapping. And then I just put it into W1 as I did before, and that's the answer. Okay, I've just got a couple of minutes to uh, answer the conundrum. Where's the images? So I could leave this as a little exercise for you because it's all, because it, does everybody see? This is something you could all do. You could compose all of these maps, including the one over eta, to, to get an expression for, um, well, let's call this one z now. And you can get z as a function of zeta by combining the map, and then you put it into w1, and you will be able to see where the images are just by looking at the formula. Does anybody know where this missing image is? Yeah. Let me finish by telling you. In complex analysis, there's uh, an area of study uh, that people are generally afraid of. It scares them a little bit. Uh, I know I was a bit intimidated by it when I first learned about it. It's, uh, it's the concept of uh, a Riemann sheet, branch cuts. And the idea that you can go around at what's called a branch point, we saw some earlier with the logarithm, and you go around the branch point, if you encircle it, you end up on a different Riemann sheet. And Riemann, I think, was motivated to create that concept by this, by things similar to this. You can see why he had that intuition. Because look at this. I need to put a point vortex somewhere, an image somewhere, but I can't put it in the fluid, which is my physical sheet, because it will change the problem. So I need more space. I need an upper level more space in my domain to put the image. And what you'll see when you go through this analysis is that, notice by the way, look at this. Z is zeta plus one is zeta. So the inverse of this is going to have a square, square root branch point. Guess where? The edges of this line. What it means is that the problem is really posed here on this fluid domain which is our physical sheet, and another sheet, which is sitting on top of this. It's a, it's not a, it's a mathematical sheet. It, it's not physical. It's an exact copy of this that you kind of think is placed on top and glued together along the branch cuts, which naturally here you would take along the walls. And guess where the image vortex is sitting? It's sitting on at this image on the upper sheet so that somehow this vortex is still feeling its influence, but it's not in a fluid sheet. Isn't it beautiful? I think this is perhaps one of the simplest ways to understand the intuition behind uh, Riemann sheets. 
the idea of giving you kind of more space to do the natural thing. Okay? All right, so that's all I'm going to say today. Wow, it took three hours. <laughs> and uh, as I said, um, <coughs> if you want to go over what we did today, that's fine. But really, it was just background. We're going to use all of the ideas again with respect to Stokes flows. But of course, I've got to start uh, by telling you what the complex formal notion of Stokes flow is, which I will uh, on Friday. Okay, so thank you. Let's start. Same time, right?